before we start uh, this tour, I actually would like to jump right in and speak about this work uh, by artist Tim Etchells, which is a neon sign that has actually come to replace uh, the old Kunsthalle Wien logo, which was placed here, and it reads songs about being free. And of course, it can be understood on the one hand as a very symbolic act uh, of a new beginning for an institution, but it also sets a tone uh, actually for the rest of the exhibition. And it, is a, it can be read in a very ambiguous or ambivalent way because we of course wonder what are those songs about being free and why do we also need them. So today we're going to embark on a guided tour through the exhibition of Bread, Wine, Cars, Security and Peace. It's the first exhibition that has been curated by a curatorial collective VHW since they took over the directorship uh, of this institution and which is composed uh, of curators uh, Natasha Ilic, Yvette Churlin and Sabina Sabolovic. My name is Laura Amman, I'm the curatorial assistant together with my colleague uh, Aziza Harmel. And the title of the exhibition is actually a quote um, of uh, Lebanese author Bilal Khbeitz and a text that he wrote where he actually describes a sort of classist uh, division of dreams between the global south and the west. And in this sense, uh, the exhibition very much tries to chart uh, political landscapes, um, but maybe much more than trying to describe uh, a, a very gloomy scenario, it also tries to come up with real alternatives. So it describes on the one hand the values that have been eroded, but it also refuses to become complicit uh, in a sort of future scenario that is based on present occurrences. And as we know, uh, currently our existence is very much shaped uh, through climate change, ecological destruction, a certain sense of a lost faith in uh, capitalist stru structures, surveillance technology, and in this sense, of course, also the resources uh, such as wine and bread. And uh, things that maybe used to be um, something that we felt very safe or secure about are not anymore, even in places where it used to be like this. So uh, in this sense, the exhibition kind of compiles proposals by a, a wide variety of uh, many artists from different uh, geographies and generations. And uh, it suggests alternatives to organize uh, our economies in a more uh, ethical and moral, morally sustainable way. And the exhibition was opened on the 8th of March, uh, of course also very symbolical date, uh, the International Women's Day, and uh, through this it's also supposed to underline, uh, of course, it's very decidedly feminist approach. And it, in short, the exhibition wants to propose a life where uh, leisure and luxury are communal goods, a life that is more pleasurable and that benefits all. It's of course quite hard uh, not to read uh, a lot of the works in the exhibition in relation to the current situation, which has very much been shaped uh, by the coronavirus outbreak and which has shown us actually how fragile uh, all these systems are and that while the virus uh, perhaps does not discriminate per se, the inequalities uh, within these systems are now much more uh, visible or even more visible than before. And we have also seen that actually the most uh, neoliberal countries have also shown the most inhumane approach to this and uh, where neoliberal thinking has been applied to healthcare systems uh, such as, for instance, in the UK or the Netherlands, um, a blind belief in self-regulation has also been applied uh, as something that, border, that is borderline uh, eugenics, actually. So we, can see, we see that uh, how fast things can change and that perhaps what we used to dream of uh, two weeks ago is very different to what we dream of today. Um, and that maybe now there is also a certain chance in this crisis that can be used as a catalyst, but that can also go in both directions. So uh, while some are discussing the need of uh, universal basic income, uh, maybe others are pushing uh, for mobile phone tracking and even more kind of uh, loose um, surveillance uh, systems. So uh, during this tour, I would like to uh, speak about around 15 artists and um, somehow reveal a little bit about the concepts of the show, but also the atmosphere that we tried to create with it and uh, also create a sort of red thread. And 
to relate it to our current state. And the first work that I would like to talk about is actually this one that we see right here, which uh, is a work by Banu Zenetoglu. And um, here we see compiled uh, in, an, uh, in 18 books all the newspapers that were published on the 5th of February in 2020 and therefore create a sort of sculptural portrait of Austria. And on the one hand, the work can be very much uh, understood as sort of revealing um, editorial strategies and how information is disseminated and which information is given what kind of space, but also which kind of layout, which kind of images are used for it. Uh, but on the other hand, we also feel quite overwhelmed by this amount of information and we realize that uh, no, matter of, or no matter if pre or post internet, we are never really able to understand the whole situation at the same time. So here we can see the work of uh, Romanian artist Dan Perzovski. Um, as we can see, he uses literally the architecture as a surface for his works. And he, there is actually a nice relation to the work we've seen before because he used to work as a caricaturist for newspapers. And of course, uh, his work is very much influenced by this. So usually he spends quite some time preparing um, his drawings and thinking about quite complex uh, political situations to then condense them into quite blunt and strong uh, graphical statements uh, that are dispersed throughout the exhibition and the institutions that he works with. And in our case, uh, we've also used his work in a way to stitch together uh, all the different issues that arise or that we find through the exhibition. This is the work of um, Laden Stilinovic. It's titled Money Environment and Stilinovic uh, was a Croatian artist that actually was very prolific, even though uh, throughout his practice um, laziness was a very central topic to him. And he understood himself very much as a sign maker, uh, as a sort of uh, working in a sort of messy minimalist style. He was very much uh, inspired by street life, by markets and by advertisement and uh, he used a very finely tuned uh, sense of humor to actually reveal power relations in our everyday lives. So here we find ourselves in an installation where there is a neatly arranged web uh, of bank notes and of coins that are dispersed on the floor and it's supposed to make us think about uh, the monetary relations that we are actually always uh, sp suspended within in our life and sometimes are more tangible and sometimes less tangible. This is the work uh, of Austrian artist uh, Monika Grabuschnik. It's titled Crash. And uh, for um, Grabuschnik, it's actually quite important to work uh, with the material clay, which is, uh, of course, a very organic material. And here, suddenly uh, it deceptively turns into a metal object. And we see these uh, hubcaps uh, or wheel rims that usually are some sort of uh, status symbol in a society that, that is very much obsessed with speed and acceleration. But here we find them actually throughout the space and they are all damaged. And it makes us think more of an apocalyptic uh, scenario than anything else. And in this sense, um, it paints maybe a more gloomy picture of where we might be headed uh, with our obsession with speed and with a, a lifestyle that is actually not very sustainable. And uh, the only silver lining that we can perhaps uh, find is uh, the idea or the thought that there are um, organic matters and fractal shapes that have long predated and will long outlive uh, humanity. So in Marva Arsanio's work, uh, Who is Afraid of Ideology? Um, we find actually a more hopeful picture and uh, the artist invites us to look at three different eco-feminist uh, initiatives that have arisen from situations of war or economic struggle. And she invites us on a journey that uh, takes place in three different places. Uh, for once in the mountains of Kurdistan, where an autonomous women's uh, movement has been founded. 
Secondly, uh, the Jinvar village, which is a village in Rojava that has been built uh, exclusively by and for women. And uh, lastly, at a cooperative in the Beka Valley, uh, which is near the Syrian border in Lebanon. And each of these ecofeminist groups actually has developed an alternative economy to care for their lands and for themselves. So through acts of caring and healing, a uh, way of self-governance is proposed uh, and lands that have been previously marginalized are reappropriated. Um, this is the work of Austrian artist uh, Melanie Ebenhoch and she confronts us actually with a very different uh, idea of dreams um, that is actually inspired by the dream factory itself, namely Hollywood, and the way that uh, an image of an ideal woman is constructed. So the quotes that we can read on the posters, one reads, so I told him that I never really dream of anything. And the other one which reads, I mean, I use my brain so much in the daytime that at night they do not seem to do anything else but rest. They're both quotes from a the book uh, Gentlemen Prefer Blondes, which was also used uh, to inspire the eponymous film starring Marilyn Monroe, and which of course uh, was herself a very fascinating personification of what could be the ideal of a woman. And a fact that she, but also others, uh, her, um, she herself and others heavily exploited. And what is interesting is that Ebenhoch actually kind of tries to change or to shift the perspective. And if we look more precisely in the background of the poster, we actually see the shape of women's legs and a vagina. And we have a face that is uh, suddenly looking back at us uh, and where we actually, the, the voyeurs or our voyeuristic uh, attempt uh, is kind of uh, interrupted by being looked back at. So she kind of changes very much and plays with this perspective. Tuan uh, Andrew Nguyen's work, My Ailing Beliefs Can Cure Your Wretched Desires, is actually also a very persuasive invitation to adopt uh, a different point of view. And in his two channel video installation, he um, creates or engages uh, two extinct animals in a heated discussion over how uh, to achieve a revolution against uh, humans. So uh, the Javan rhino, uh, which has been extinct, actually proposes that only a violent uprising can be a solution against humanity who has treated uh, animals so badly in their lives. And um, the, uh, the turtle, which is his sparring partner in this conversation, proposes that perhaps a more peaceful uh, and patient attempt can also lead uh, to, an, to a more peaceful cohabitation between animals and humans, and proposes to actually look at um, strategies of karma and reincarnation as a possible strategy in this sense. And the video works with very powerful imagery and also sound, uh, showing us all kinds of different uh, situations uh, in life where animals uh, and humans um, interact. Contrasting these different viewpoints, uh, the artist actually refuses uh, to erase uh, things out of culture, and he proposes a shift towards uh, other sorts of beliefs uh, working perhaps with different um, ways of looking at history. In Hatze Pleiner's uh, installation, Turn a Deaf Ear to Shoes for White People, we have a look actually at a very different kind uh, of women's organization. And uh, this group of works actually deals uh, with um, the fraternity hysteria, which the artist herself is part of and which is a women-only organization that actually uh, fights for the golden matriarchy, for uh, general protection of men, for the restriction of voting rights of men, and for a minimum 80% quota of women and transgender people uh, for public positions. So in her installation, she actually uses uh, very symbolically charged uh, objects that reference the identity and the legacy of this fraternity. And we can see uh, portraits of illustrious members of this fraternity, uh, but also the mascot, the hyena, 
which represents a matriarchal system. And um, we actually also see a, a pile of new balance shoes that have been very much associated with right-wing um, supporters. So at the end, we are left to wonder what happened to those supporters in this uh, bleak scenario and if they have maybe met a violent end. So here is another work by artist uh, Tim Etchells, and, uh, which is called Mirror Pieces. And as we can see, the phrases uh, optical illusions, poetical confusions and political delusions are placed and mismatched against each other, creating a sort of uh, hallucinatory scene where we can ourselves uh, interpret what these words mean to us. And again, he kind of opens up a very poetic uh, political space of words where um, our own interpretations, but also misinterpretations, allow uh, or evoke a thought process uh, within us as the audience. So in Andrea Sigmund's installation, we find uh, 47 busts that have been modeled in clay, and uh, which is of course a material that is quite rough and quite cheap, but they show uh, the wealthy mothers and fathers uh, of capitalism. And so we will find uh, economists, philosophers, but also historians that kind of portray a genealogy of uh, neoliberal thinking and um, which has been, of course, crucial for capitalist systems that seem to uh, actually dominate uh, all aspects of our lives. And what is particularly interesting uh, is that for uh, neoliberal thinking, the Austrian school of economists uh, was quite crucial and therefore the relation to the city uh, here and them being exhibited at Kunsthalle Wien is even more interesting. And the Austrian school uh, was actually developed in the late 19th uh, century and early 20th century. And it is a school that uh, proclaims that all social phenomena actually result exclusively from the motivations and actions of individuals. Uh, so something that was of course picked up uh, in neoliberal thinking and where uh, actually conquering data uh, at the end became much more important than conquering territory. Uh, because uh, uh, collecting data enables us to actually influence behaviors and to manipulate public opinion ultimately. Uh, and in this sense, this also brings us uh, from the Austrian school uh, to Silicon Valley and uh, such figures as, for example, Mark uh, Zuckerberg or Peter Thiel uh, or philosopher Ayn Rand uh, with her ideas about uh, selfishness and the value of selfishness um, very much appealed uh, to Silicon Valley thinking uh, and which also brings us already to the next work uh, by Zach Blas. In Zach Blas installation um, Contra Internet um, we actually find uh, ideas relating to feminism and queerness um, mingling uh, with concerns around new technologies. So Zach Blas is for instance concerned with biometric control or also network hegemony. And uh, actually the centerpiece of the installation is the short film Jubilee 2033, which was heavily inspired by uh, Derek Jarman's Jubilee from 1978. And in the movie, uh, we accompany Ayn Rand, uh, the philosopher that we already mentioned before, uh, who travels into the future on an acid trip together with her collective. And on this trip, she is guided by an artificial intelligence and she lands uh, in a very dystopic scenario in Silicon Valley where actually uh, all the campuses are burning, where techies are being captured and where the CEOs are being executed. During this trip, she realizes that uh, her ideas around the virtues of selfishness and rogue individualism uh, allowed for the internet to become an instrument of oppression, of accelerated capitalism. Uh, but we're also presented with an alternative, um, namely through the character of uh, Noah Tropics, who is a contrasexual uh, and contra-internet prophet who is lecturing us on the end of the internet as we know it. So here we can see the drawings uh, by Selma Selman, uh, titled Superposition Intersectionalism, and Selma Selman is uh, an artist uh, whose approach is very much informed by uh, coming of age during the Bosnian War and by being of Roma origin. 
And so she very often deals with uh, notions of statelessness, of multi-generational trauma and of uh, issues of bare survival. And in her drawing series, uh, Superpositional Intersectionalism, she actually creates a term of her own, which is on the one hand based uh, on the term superposition, which is borrowed from ideas of quantum physics, and which describes the ability to be in multiple states at the same time uh, until measured. And intersectionalism uh, actually refers to the notions that categories such as race, class and gender are of course always interrelated and connected to each other. But what she's actually trying to do within the drawings is to oppose uh, any such categorization or to elude such a categorization. And therefore we see uh, on the drawings uh, visually rearranged bodies and cultures that reveal uh, the fluidity that uh, actually um, is possible between them. So we encounter more surreal, dreamlike situations where uh, breasts have claws and uh, limbs turn into other shapes and one body becomes two or three or more. Uh, so Anne-Marie Jelle is an artist that uh, worked very much from the periphery, uh, from Vorarlberg and from Liechtenstein, and therefore uh, has not been very well known so far, which is something that is very important for us to also uh, show in this exhibition. And for her, actually working from this very specific situation uh, in a very Catholic, uh, Alemannic, patriarchal system is also very much what informed her practice uh, that evolved a lot around notions of home, but also the homeland. And uh, initially during her career, she was uh, connected to the Fluxus movement, but then more and more retreated actually into her own home. Here at the exhibition we have actually 22 works by her, but she was a very prolific artist and left a, a very fresh uh, and transient legacy of more than uh, 1,600 works. And in her works, she actually, there are many recurring topics, such as, for instance, the phrase, Ich bin daheim, that could be read uh, in a kind of very positive, but also uh, in a very negative way of being trapped at home questioning the role of the woman and the housewife in the 70s and 80s uh, of rural Austria. So she's, she's often playing with words, there is a lot of humor involved and there is also certain obsessiveness uh, in her work. Um, there are also other works, for instance, um, a rosary made of coins where she alludes of course to the uh, unholy alliance uh, of religion and economy, um, but also here again uh, an item very much related to the, to the housewife and to the role of women at the time, but also references to, uh, to nationalism uh, that are uh, still very much alive in this context. So uh, Sadi Choa's work uh, actually comes from a very different uh, context but she also uses her personal uh, experience uh, of growing up uh, in a place where she felt she didn't belong to, to create this work, which is actually a six-channel uh, video installation uh, by the title, Am I the only one who is like me? And in these six videos, she uses a, a wide variety of materials, of imagery, but also of text, for instance, juxtaposing uh, rap songs uh, with uh, a singing performance by child star Shirley Temple, uh, reading quotes from Toni Morrison's uh, The Bluest Eye, uh, and for instance, quoting uh, casual racist comments that she has encountered in her own context. So she creates a very complex uh, audiovisual collage, and what she also does is that she actually juxtaposes um, images of strong uh, non-white women, such as, for instance, painter Frida Kahlo or rapper Missy Elliott or author Bell Hook. So the, the work is very much uh, an appeal to, on the one hand, uh, decolonize feminism, but at the same time, it also points out um, stereotypical imagery that is uh, used time and again uh, to maintain a dominant system of discrimination. And so we arrive to the last work uh, of this guided tour, uh, which uh, is actually by Austrian artist uh, Daniel Spörri. 
and uh, he also in a way works with uh, repurposing uh, existing material and he kind of creates a remix uh, in his work uh, titled Fadenscheinige Orakel in German which could be translated to something like uh, threadbare oracles. He was very amused by popular uh, textile wall hangings that he found uh, and he used his collection uh, cut up this very peculiar uh, kind of vocabulary that is used and recreated uh, new little poems or fake proverbs with them. So he was amused by the naive beliefs, by the uncritical hope that was uh, formulated through them and by the clumsy rhymes and he proposes in a way uh, much more open but also much more honest and bleak statements that uh, work perhaps more um, as an invitation to us uh, to appropriate them and interpret them the way we would like to. <laughs>